the intersection of endurance sport, health, fitness and life. Challenging conventional ideas and empowering people with the science of self-propelled motion. This is the Endurance Experience Podcast, hosted by Tony Rich. Passage from the Story of the Human Body, Evolution, Health, and Disease, Daniel E. Lieberman. One of the most important adaptations for human running is our unique ability to cool by sweating instead of panting, thanks to millions of sweat glands combined with a lack of fur. Most mammals have sweat glands on just their palms, but apes and old world monkeys have some sweat glands elsewhere on their bodies, and at some point in human evolution, we exuberantly augmented the number of sweat glands to between 5 and 10 million. When we heat up, sweat glands secrete mostly water onto the body's surface. When the sweat evaporates, it cools the skin, the blood beneath, and the entire body. Humans can sweat more than a liter per hour, enough to cool an athlete running hard in hot conditions. Even though the temperature at the 2004 Olympic women's marathon in Athens reached 35 degrees Celsius, 95 degrees Fahrenheit, high sweat rates enabled the winner to run at an average speed of 10.7 miles per hour for more than two hours without overheating. No other mammal can do that because they lack sweat glands and because mammals are covered with fur. Fur is useful to reflect solar radiation as a hat does to protect the skin and to attract mates, yet fur keeps air from circulating close to the skin, preventing sweat from evaporating. Humans actually have the same density of hairs as a chimpanzee, but most human hair is very fine, like peach fuzz. We do not yet know why humans evolved lots of sweat glands and lost their fur, but I suspect These adaptations first evolved either in the genus Homo or they initially evolved in Australopithecus and then became elaborated in Homo. Although fur and sweat glands don't fossilize, humans have dozens of additional adaptations in our muscles and bones for endurance running whose traces first appear in fossils of Homo erectus. Most of these features allow us to use our legs like giant springs to jump efficiently from one leg to another in a manner totally different from walking, which uses the legs like a pendulum. When your foot hits the ground during a run, your your hips, knees, and ankles flex during the first half of stance, causing your center of mass to drop, thus stretching many of the muscles and tendons in your legs. When these tissues stretch, they store up elastic energy which they release while recoiling during the second half of stance, helping you jump into the air. In fact, a running human's legs store and release energy so efficiently that running is only about 30 to 50 percent more costly than walking in the endurance speed range. What's more, these springs are so effective that they make the cost of human endurance running, but not sprinting, independent of speed. It costs the same number of calories to run 5 miles at a pace of 7 to 10 minutes per mile, a phenomenon many people find counterintuitive. So that was a short passage from Professor Lieberman's Chapter 4, a section called Evolved to Run. I highly recommend the book. It will change and shift your understanding about the human body. The book takes on evolution, health, and disease of humans over the past six million years. So a little bit more about Professor Lieberman. He is the Edwin M. Lerner, the second professor of biological sciences, professor of human evolutionary biology, and the chair of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology 
at Harvard University. He's had a very broad research agenda and has worked extensively on evolutionary adaptations in humans and the evolution of walking and running. He studied the human fossil record and applies analyses to draw conclusions about changes in the human body, including disease resulting from evolutionary mismatches. Many of you probably have seen him speak. He's been tapped to speak in many documentaries. In fact, there's currently a two-part documentary on Netflix titled The Evolution of Us, which I highly recommend. You can see Professor Lieberman there. He's even been on the Stephen Colbert show, the old show, The Colbert Report. He was on that show twice. And uh, some of his work was popularized in the best-selling book, Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. And so I've been following Professor Lieberman's work for about a decade or more. And so I was very appreciative that he agreed to come on the Endurance Experience podcast. I didn't have a great deal of time with him, so I tried to fit in as many questions as possible that I thought listeners may find interesting and perhaps some things that listeners may have not heard in the treasure trove of information he has out on the on the internet i did at least attempt to get his thoughts on the public's seemingly all-consuming fascination with the outperformance of the kenyan and ethiopian runners recently particularly in marathon events i couldn't really pin him down on specifics there i think i understand why but i think you'll find the dialogue at least uh, interesting we talk about pronation running sneakers and the idea propagated by some shoe manufacturers uh, that they can create a shoe that can uh, substantially influence performance in running and i was able to get them to weigh in a little bit on um sexual dimorphism and the scientific aspects of the uh, differences between men and women uh, and performance in sport. So I do get him to weigh in on some of that. I think, though, ultimately you'll see that from the discussion, Professor Lieberman is primarily concerned about bigger questions of cultural evolution and solving problems from uh, the results of cultural evolutions like disease and other big problems affecting humans and the planet. So, without further further delay, I give you Professor Daniel Lieberman. <laughs> Professor Daniel Lieberman, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. All right. So, I wanted to start off by you know, first having you describe to our listeners your background and your research agenda and how that led you to write the book, The Story of the Human Body. So, I'm a, I'm a sort of a cross between an anthropologist and a sort of experimental biologist. I, I study the human evolution. I'm interested in how and why our bodies are the way they are. But I'm especially interested in the evolution of human physical activity and how that relates to health and disease. And uh, I guess over the years, um, um, my interest in um, my interests have evolved. And I, I, I was originally more focused on basically what happened in human evolution. But mm -hmm. as, my, as my research career went on, I got more and more interested in why anybody should care about it. Partly because of teaching. Because, you know, I teach my students all about you know, famous you know, discoveries and important changes that occurred in human evolution, and a lot of them dutifully learn it, but when we get to issues like, like uh, you know, diabetes and heart disease and cancer and osteoporosis and arthritis, they perk up um, for, for good reason, because, you know, most of them aren't going to become paleontologists, but right. everybody has to deal with these issues. And so, over the years, I became more interested in why anybody should really care about human evolution in the first place, and that led to the book... Uh, the story of the human body, which was um, which was my attempt to sort of answer that question both uh, to myself but also to uh, to readers. Right, and I highly recommend the book to to the listeners. And I finished the last chapter today, and it 
you go from hunter gatherers and as you say the explanation of why our bodies the way that that they are six million years ago all the way through to modern times and some of the cultural evolution that has happened with feedback loops and all the interesting things like shoes and eyeglasses and chairs that you know create these negative feedback loops and i found all of it very interesting for instance things like wisdom teeth and why why we need to get our wisdom teeth taken out and and all of it's in there that one particular i wonder if you can expand on that one a little because i think it'd be interesting to some of the listeners well so impacted wisdom teeth are an example of mismatch right so a mismatch is when there is a um when the sort of the, the way in which our bodies evolved and adapted are are not well suited to the modern world, right? Where there's where right. we're imperfectly or inadequately adapted to modern novel environments, and uh, so wisdom teeth are a, a sort of a nice example of that, but with an interesting twist, which I'll get to. But you know, your teeth are very heritable in terms of how their size, so pretty much determined by the size by by genes, uh, but your jaw size, like. The jaws are bones, right? right. Like every other bone in the human body is, is influenced by how you use it. And uh, every time you chew food, you generate forces, which generate stresses, which generate strains, which affect how your jaw grows. And human jaws have gotten smaller over the last uh, few hundred, few thousand years as we eat more processed foods. You know, our food is ground and cooked and mashed and, and you know, cuisinarded and all kinds of other stuff. That means that we spend much less time chewing today than we used to. Right. And the result is our jaws don't grow as much, but our teeth are still the same size, so we're more likely to have crowding. And um, that said, so so about 25% of us now do actually need our wisdom teeth removed. That said, um, the fear of this uh, has become a bit of an industry among orthodontists who who remove a lot of wisdom teeth that probably actually don't need to be removed. So, uh, so you know, if you do have dental crowding, you should get them <laughs> removed. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I, but, I, I but, had mine. But not removed. everybody actually needs them removed who's told that they need them removed. But that's another story. Yeah, yeah. It's, <clears throat> I found that in, in the book, there's a many things like that. And then I had to get mine removed as an adult. And uh, I chose to do it without any anesthesia or anything. And I could literally feel my jaw breaking when, when he, when he pulled him out, it was, it was pretty, wow, do that. You know, anesthesia is a good thing. Yeah. I was nervous a little bit about anesthesia. I don't <laughs> know why I can't remember, but I could literally feel, I mean, you, you literally feel your jaw break. Right. So there's, you know, the first, first anesthesia, anesthesia, uh, the first surgery done with anesthesia was done right across the river from my office here. Oh uh, yeah. Massachusetts general hospital. MGH, you can okay. still see the room. Yeah, interesting. But uh, there's tons of things like that. That, that that's just interesting. And, and that, you know, decades ago, I read a book called The Selfish Gene, which ch- changed the way I thought about bodies and everything. And I think this book will do do that for many people. So um, in your chapter, and the, and the reason why I wanted to talk to you today is to you know talk about running or the, the, the evolution of bipedalism, which I think is your chapter two, I think many of our listeners will, will find that, that very interesting. So can you describe that, uh, how bipedal, bipedalism evolved and then, and, and then running? Well, we still don't know exactly how bipedalism evolved, but uh, it looks like the very earliest fossils of creatures that are more closely related to us than to chimpanzees, we call them hominins. The very oldest hominins that we have appear to have been bipeds. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but they evolved probably for walking, not for running. Um, and um, and sort of the best guess as to why that occurred is because um, this was a period of major climate change in, in Africa, well, ev- everywhere around the planet. But in Africa, where our ancestors lived, uh, the forests were sort of breaking up and there was more woodland and more kind of open habitats. And our ancestors, who probably relied primarily on fruits, had to basically travel farther to get food. Mm-hmm. But, um, our ancestors were probably very much like chimpanzees. They knuckle walked. And we know from various experiments that knuckle walking is extremely costly. It costs a chimp more than twice as much energy per unit mass, per unit distance to walk as a, as a human. And over long, long distances, that, 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 those calories really add up. So it looks like, whereas bipeds um, save energy, um, 
but uh, but probably also were still able to climb trees. So so it looks like our first ancestors essentially became upright in order to save energy. Um, and the, the 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 so that's the good news. The bad news is it made us slow. Uh, as soon as you become a biped, you're half as slow as a quadruped. Right. You generate power with only two legs instead of four. And so when that happened, it set the stage uh, for selection that occurred later on around you know, sometime between two and three million years ago, as there was further environmental change in Africa and habitats started opening, it set the stage for the evolution of endurance running, mm -hmm. uh, which enabled us to become hunters. I remember you saying that you know, humans run 28 miles an hour at our fastest if you're Usain Bolt, but a quadruped, a squirrel, a small quadruped will run faster than that. That's correct. Uh, so the very fastest humans are 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 well. They're faster compared to fast compared to most of us, mm -hmm. um, but they're not fast compared to most uh, most serious animals out there. So if uh, if Usain Bolt or any other sort of major sprinter wanted to try to get dinner, or or for that matter, avoid being somebody else's dinner uh, by sprinting, uh, he'd be toast. Um, uh, you just can't outrun. You know quadrupeds like gazelle and you know deer right. lions and cheetah and saber-toothed tigers they right. are that's not going to happen but what we do excel at is at long distance endurance running where right. we can uh, outlast them uh, over long distances right so th so the question is if, if if natural selection is about what's profitable to the body the natural question is why would bipedalism be be, be profitable and well, the, so the answer yeah. is energy energy right life is all about energy we're here basically to do one thing which is to get in energy and produce more of us mm -hmm. that's it the rest is all extra yeah and it's very interesting that if you if you ask someone on what's another bipedal mammal or anything and they, they would f find it very difficult to even think of one Right, so kangaroos. Well, plenty of other bi bipeds. I mean, birds. Bur birds, Dinosaurs. kangaroos, yeah. right. Uh, kangaroos, exactly. But right. we're the only striding, uh, tailless, featherless bipeds. Right. Okay. And so your, uh, your work became famous, or I would say I mean, it began to get a lot of interest in in. Christopher McDougall's book, Born to Run, where you talk about minimalists and, 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 and barefoot running. What's the latest research on, on this, on, on barefoot and minimalist running? Has there been any new research within the last, say, say 10 years on this? Um, well, let's, 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 let's unpack that statement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, um, when we, we published our hypothesis of Bramble and Lieberman paper in Nature, which, by the way, was entitled Born to Run, mm -hmm. um, something that McDougall doesn't mention, by the way, um, in 2004. It was the cover of Nature. That was really the, I mean, that was in the, that was really what, um, you know, of course, I, I, by then I was already, had some notoriety, I guess, but, but that got a lot of attention. Um, and that's how and why journalists who were covering things like, you know, uh, running started to pay attention to mm -hmm. us. Um, and then over the years, since after that, that happened, we then started studying, if, you know, if we started studying the evolution of running, the next thing was obviously to study the evolution of, of how we ran before shoes. So we started studying barefoot running probably around 2005, 2006 in my lab. So we've been doing that a lot. And then, and then McDougall came along and published his book, um, which popularized some of this research, although I have to say he got a lot of details wrong. Yeah, uh, uh, more wrong than right in some regards, um, and that turned into kind of a. Well, if you ever do a Google search, you know you can do a Google trend search. You know about that? You yeah. can actually get on Google Trends, and you type in the word barefoot running, and it's pretty. Well, that tells my life, right? Uh, because the the nobody searched for it until until McDougall's book came out in two thousand and nine. Then you see people started searching more for it. And then the day our paper came out in Nature, it was on the front page of New York Times and all sorts of other stuff, there's this giant spike <laughs> in right. how many people searched the term. Yeah. It, it went up like tenfold that one day. 
and has basically well, it's slowly dwindled since then. But it, it stayed very high for a long period of time. Yeah. So uh, that can tell you what like my uh, email inbox was like and the phone was like for a while. So because that was the first serious scientific study on barefoot running, and what we showed was that, um, and explained biomechanically that um, when people take their shoes off, they end up instead of landing on their heels which creates this collisional impact, they tend to land on the ball of their foot. And we explain the biomechanics behind why that doesn't cause an impact peak. So if you run barefoot down a street, a paved street, you'll quick, quickly stop landing on your heel because it hurts. <clears throat> and, and the answer to that is some interesting physics, which we could get into if you want to. Um, sure. And that turned into a crazy industry. I mean, there's been hundreds of maybe several hundreds of papers now on barefoot running. Um, more, and then, you know, more or less what we showed has stood the test of time. Uh, 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 but what, what, what is still controversial is to what extent that's better for you than wearing a shoe. And I, I, one of the things that I really object to is how people engage in what I call paleo fantasy. Remember what we said earlier that the reason we, we – we evolved is to take an energy and have more babies, right? We didn't evolve to be nice, to be happy, mm -hmm. to be healthy. We evolved to have more babies, right? So just because our ancestors did something doesn't mean it's necessarily better for you. And that's one of the, the ways in which I object to the way in which barefoot running has been portrayed. Now, that said, I think we can learn a lot from running, from barefoot running. And um, I think there are probably better and worse ways to run. But shoes themselves don't dictate uh, how you run. They influence how you run. And what really matters is how you run. Shoes affect that. So that's kind of been the story about barefoot running. Um, we actually have a paper that's coming out in Nature next week that's about to hit the press <coughs> on barefoot walking. Um, one of the things that surprised me is there's been so much interest in barefoot running, and yet nobody seems to have studied the more obvious gait, which is walking, which is what most of us do most of the time. And why everybody has just focused on barefoot running is, to me, a little bit of a mystery. But there we are. I don't understand. Um, yeah. I don't understand the kind of herd mentality that occurs, but but. Right, but hopefully uh, the the paper that we have that's coming out next week will um, will uh, um, will get more interested in barefoot walking because that also is important. It's arguably much more important than barefoot yeah. running. But but unpacking <clears throat> some, some of the, the the science on on barefoot running, there there is uh, our ancestors adapted various characteristics, um, nuchal ligament sort of springs in our feet and such. Can, can you unpack some, some of that? So that's not, that's nothing to do with barefoot running. That's nothing to do with running. So our, our bodies are, are filled with adaptations from right. our heads to our toes that enable us to be very good at running. Mm -hmm. um, those include, as you say, the, the arch in the foot, the short toes, the long Achilles tendon, the big gluteus maximus, um, the nuchal ligament, which helps stabilize the head. Uh, there's more. But, um, but those are all for running. Right. Per se, it's not for barefoot running. Mm -hmm. The key adaptation for barefoot running <clears throat> is the same as for barefoot walking. It's having calluses on your feet, and everybody that's a that's you know if you just take your shoes off, you'll develop calluses. Um, <clears throat> so, um, um, and then the so the other sort of the other way of thinking about it is that it's not just adaptations that it make, enable us to do these tasks. They're also skills. To me, running is a skill, right? Right. Um, just like swimming is a skill or, you know, playing golf is a skill or tennis is a skill or you know, all kinds of physical activities are skills and, and you have to learn how to do it properly. And one of the things that we've ceased to do in our world today is teach people how to run properly. Yeah. I think that what we can learn most about barefoot running is, is what's a, a more impact free way of, of running. So there are plenty of people who run on, in shoes, land on their heels and don't get very injured. That's fine. But there are plenty of people who do get injured. And if that's if, you, if that describes you, um, then maybe you can learn something about about sort of more natural forms of running uh, that might be better for you. But if you do, it's not a panacea. It's not a magic bullet. It's not like it's like that. And that's one of the things I dislike about the book Born to Run. It makes it seem like just take your shoes off, all will be fine. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, you'll have no injuries, and your teeth will be whiter, and girls will like you more, and you know <laughs> all that. Right. Um, that's just ridiculous, right? Everything has trade-offs. Um, and runners will get injured partly because injuries occur from just doing stuff, right? right? So the question is, how can we learn from barefoot running? How can we adapt our bodies? How do we have to develop strength in our shoes, in our feet, in our ankles, in our calves, etc., in order to do it? You can't just 
you know, if I were to go out and just start lifting weights, right, I would get injured. Mm-hmm. Same thing is true if I just suddenly start go out and running barefoot, I would get injured. And um, and so, uh, uh, we, so people need to be careful about using and and or misusing evolutionary information. Yeah, and one of the things that you write about in your book is the impact, the impact transient from landing on on your heel. So that sends an impact transient up up your legs, and that could potentially lead to problematic injuries. Is that right? Am I, am I stating that correct? Yes, right. And but you know, but shoes shoes dampen that, right? Mm-hmm. Shoes lower that rate of loading. So one of the questions is to what extent and how much do shoes help and how much do shoes hurt? And it's that's still an open question. Right. I, you know, I know lots of people who are heel strikers and. And are just fine. And I also know lots of people who are heel strikers who are injured. And I know barefoot runners who get injured. There's, you know, if you're looking for a simple answer, you will not find it. Right, right. But people love simple answers. Yeah. And so you, I don't see as many now, but you used to go into any shoe store and you would see some chart, some picture that said pronate, pronator, neutral pronator, over pronator, supernator. And then they would use that to point you to different types of support and is, is there anything from your research that you've seen any new research about pronation as to whether pronation <laughs> really does anything well no pronation is a, pronation is a normal natural movement i mean I, right. I, the reason i laugh is that to say you you know pronation is a problem is like saying you know chewing is a problem I mean, <laughs> right you know, right pronation pronation is a combination of three movements in your foot the primary one being the rolling in of your foot the eversion of your foot um, but there's also some abduction and and uh, and and uh, and, um, and other movements. But the important point is that uh, you know pronation is normal. The problem is it has been argued that too much pronation is a problem. Mm-hmm. But but here's the rub: shoes with very high heels, like cushioned modern running shoes with high heels, increase the torque that causes pronation. So then those shoes then put in other features in the shoe to then correct for the pronation caused by the shoe itself. Um, if you run barefoot, you're just not going to have that problem. Right. Um, um, that said, and the studies that have also tried to, to, to measure the effects of pronation control have found that um, there's no evidence whatsoever that those prescriptions um, actually uh, prevent injury. So... Uh, and there's no science behind motion control shoes, none whatsoever. Right. And then uh, the scientist Irene Davis, you mentioned, has, has a great body of research there on, on that bears that out. Well, she's one of many people who've worked on this problem, absolutely. Yeah. Even some of the people who originally proposed this stuff have now recanted. So, right. So, yeah. So, yeah, so that's if, what you I mean. to, if you go to a running store and some, some, some employee of the running store gets behind on their knees and watches you run and tells you you need this kind of shoe or that kind of shoe, they're just basically BSing. Yeah, uh, and I laugh. Pseudoscience. Every time I see it, and you don't see see as many of those charts anymore. You, they used to be on in every running oh, yeah, store. Absolutely, but you, yeah, because yeah. the science has been discredited. But, right. but still, it sells shoes because exactly. it looks like somebody's doing science on you. Now, on, on that in that same vein, um, as a coach, I, I I talk to runners all the time about this. Is there any new research at all? about any manufacturer that can create a shoe that can make a runner perform faster. I mean, without even mentioning any, any manufacturers, they come up all of the time. We got a new shoe that will increase. Well, your- there is one shoe. Yes. I yeah. mean, we, we know there's this new, am I allowed to mention that? Uh, sure. <laughs> okay. So, so, I mean, we know there's this new Nike shoe. Yeah. The Nike shoe. Yeah. That, um, that has a basically a built in spring in it. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, we haven't tested it in my lab, but the evidence suggests, and it makes sense to me, that it essentially adding, um, you know, it decreases how much work your calf muscles have to do, and it adds some spring. And the evidence that I've read suggests that it improves, you know, decreases your, your cost of running by several percentage points, as much as 4%, I believe. So, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, you know, in a, in a competitive marathon, saving... Saving that much energy, or, or, you know, can really make a difference between uh, between winning and losing. So, uh, so yes, that that's the one. But that's about performance. That's not about injury. So remember, people often confuse pro- aspects of shoes that are designed for performance with those that you know, in terms of economy or speed. Right. 
but that doesn't that's not the same thing as injury and if your goal is to go out there and just not get injured that has nothing to do necessarily with yeah. uh, with uh, with whether or not you're going to win you know the new york marathon yeah well, most that, of us sadly are not going to do that shoe they said had an 11 millimeter drop and now they said it's, it's an eight millimeter drop and then yeah, so but the issue is not the drop the issue is this carbon plate inside it that's the key. That's the key element in the shoe. There, that's this extra spring that's been added inside the shoe. Well, the the, the IWF yeah. looked at it and th- they basically concluded, yeah, the, <laughs> we're we're not worried about it. They, they they basically said, paraphrasing what they said, because they're obsessed. Any any regulatory body is obsessed with fairness, and so they looked at it and said, yeah, we're not we're not concerned about it at this time. So I, I'd be interested. Which, is, which, which makes no sense to me because if, if one runner has a contract with Nike and has this shoe that saves 4% and another one doesn't, yeah. that, is that fair? Yeah, yeah. Well, I I'd mean, be interested in seeing that's the like research. It's like giving somebody a drug that increases their performance by 4%. I mean, it's not a drug. You don't inject it. But it's, it strikes me as um, uh, I, I, I question that. Yeah. Well, I'd be looking forward to seeing the research after, after you uh, test out the, the vapor fly to see if the claim is uh, – it's legitimate. <laughs> well, I'm sure plenty of other people are going to be doing it. I don't. I don't. I'm an evolutionary biologist. I'm not interested in testing the vapor fly. Yeah. So on that, you, you so you spent some um, some time in Kenya on sabbatical. I'm interested to to see. That. Actually, not. No, I, I I spent my time on sabbatical doing. I'm I'm about to head to Kenya next week. But we've been working in Kenya for the last. I grew up for the last ten years. So Got we, it. Yeah. So we 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 have a long term research project. The original paper on barefoot running, for example, was done in this region in Kenya. So, uh, sorry, to interrupt. Yeah, well, I was I was going to say I'm interested in, in in knowing what your 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 research and experiences are there, because particularly the question to follow that up is the the Kenyan and Ethiopian runners really have dominated the marathon, and infrequently do you do you see an American. Break, break well, first down. of all, remember, I, I'm not interested in winning marathons, my, either myself or anybody else. Um, and that's not why we're in Kenya. We're not studying elite runners. We're, we're, we go to Kenya because, I, again, I'm an evolutionary biologist. Nobody in the past ever got on one line and ran as fast as they could 26.2 miles to another line. Right? This is a mo- right. <laughs> modern, weird behavior that, um, that is, um, um, is irrelevant to human evolution, right? So what I'm interested in is the reason we work in Kenya is that we're interested in the transition between, you know, modern lifestyles and more, 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 you know, ancestral, more, um, you know, the way, the way our great 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 grandparents used to be, right? right? And so we can we have a natural experiment there because we can look compare people who from the same um, ethnic group, the Kalenjin, mm-hmm. who are in town living lives more or less like you and me and wearing shoes and riding buses and sitting at desks all day long with people who live up in the, in the more rural areas who don't have shoes and there's no, because there's no water, there's no electricity, there's very few roads, there's, they're, they're, they're basically subsistence farmers. And so we can, we originally started looking at, at barefoot running there because um, that was the original research question, but the project has grown to look at, at not just, running but also walking and we've been looking at people's energy balance we've been looking at at lower back pain and we've been looking at um um, um how they carry things and and mm-hmm. and more so we're, we're looking at their bodies really um and um uh, and that's really the goal of the the project so so yes some of the world's best runners do come from this region but um but that we're not studying those elite runners that right. that's not a that's not a behavior that um that 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 we're trying to study. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, interested in. But, st- but it is interesting that I mean, people do always ask me, you know, why why the Kenyans and Ethiopians dominate world running, and and the answer is that if anybody tells you they know the answer, they're being self deceptive. Right? <laughs> right. They don't know. Nobody knows the answer to that question. Nobody's ever found any genes that confer a ma- major advantage. There, um, nobody's been able to find. You know, people come up with all kinds of hypotheses. And, and what I find very disturbing about that is that, you know, if, 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 if we had been having this conversation, if there were podcasts, you know, you know, a hundred years ago or so, mm-hmm. everybody would be asking why the Finns are the world's greatest runners. And I'll make a bet. Nobody would be saying, oh, well, maybe they have special genes or, or they're, you know, they're, they have special rituals that make them, you know, less, to- more tolerant to pain. We have, it seems that we have to, we, 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 in, we insist as a, 
we being some people, insist on coming up with essentially sort of excuses almost for why, you know, why the Kenyans and the Ethiopians dominate. Mm -hmm. But if you go there, the reason, you know, when you see people running to train for, for, for marathons, boy, do they work hard, right? It's a, it's, 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 they've got a system, right? They, they have a, a fantastic group of, 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 of coaches and and um, and clubs and, and sort of just community sort of running programs that identify talent. People run together in groups. They push themselves really hard. They don't have trainers and goo and all kinds of stuff like that. But also you have to remember that that that's the kind of industry there. And there's also incredible poverty in this region. Mm-hmm. Kids growing up there see running as a way out of out of poverty. Yes, and they work hard at it in a way that. You know, American kids just can't and wouldn't, right? Uh, how many American kids who are like eight years old or ten years old think that they want to be a world class marathon runner? None, no, right? right. They, they they want to be great football players or baseball players or whatever. But 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 you know, winning the Boston Marathon is not a you know maybe you know maybe a few kids, right? But it's not something that American kids grow up doing. But if you grew up in this region of Kenya or in Ethiopia. That's what you want to be, and you, and you work hard at it. And how do you measure the kind of heart that goes into that kind of training, right? Yeah. Uh, the, yes. uh, the intensity, the, 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 the desire, you know, running three times a day and pushing yourself constantly to the limit, right? Mm-hmm. How do you measure the effect of that on performance? Right. You can't. Yeah. And until you can, you should shut up about, you know, what makes Kenyans and Ethiopians better than the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's an uh, amazing documentary on Netflix, Gun Runners, and it was it was all about that Kenyan runners who were running to escape horrible socioeconomic situations, and it could be ex- exactly what you're what you're describing, right? So Americans, we we don't seem to be very good at soccer. Everybody beats us at soccer, and it might be you know, for the same reasons. Just well, of course, it's for the same reason, but nobody yeah. says Americans are genetically disadvantaged at soccer. <laughs> right, exactly. Right? <laughs> or that Brazilians have soccer genes. Nobody says that. So why do we say that about Kenyans and running? Exactly, yeah. It's racism, yeah. frankly. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So, uh, <clears throat> and we want to be sensitive to your time. So the, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is, uh, you know, the biggest question in running right now, in fact, you know, there's a, a post on CNN about it is the potential performance differences between uh, transgender athletes and and other athletes and trying to figure out fairness, performance advantages, and, and such. And you know, if 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 you, if you wrote a book about or a paper about this, it'd, it'd probably be the most widely circulated book or paper just because of the. Uh, the, the frequency in which it's been discussed within the last, you know, several weeks and months. So, uh, given your, you know, your your re- your broad research agenda on these topics, where do you think that this is going? And is there a, is there a way to systematically research and study performance advantages? <laughs> well, again, I'm an evolutionary biologist, and and I really. This may be shocking to a lot of people, but I really don't give a hoot about elite performance very yeah. much. I think we spend way too much time in our culture caring about people at the very end of the extreme. And what we should really care more about is the average everyday person who struggles to run five kilometers or, or, or whatever. And, 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 and it's, it's, like, it's like caring too much about far, you know, elite fashion uh, and, as opposed to the rest of us. I think we have a diseased attitude towards elite performance. Yeah. Um, and we, and we should really recognize it for what it is, which is a professional form of entertainment. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, I love watching great performances. I'm not opposed to it, et cetera. But I think that the the attention that we pay to it, um, is sometimes distracts from attention that we should pay to the average everyday person. So it doesn't mean that, that we shouldn't care about it, but I think we, 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 we have a skewed um, a perspective. But on that, on that, vein, in that vein, as an evolutionary biologist, for instance, you know, one of, one of the questions in this vein is about dimorphism or sexual dimorphism. And, and well, sure. How- I mean, yes, males are different from females. I mean, that's not like a you don't need to be an evolutionary biologist to know that, right? right. And um, 
you know, males are bigger than females on average. But more importantly, males have a lot more muscle mass um, than females. I can't remember the exact number, but I think the average male is about 61 to 70% more muscle mass than a female, especially in the upper body. Now, and the, and the reason for that is, well, steroids, right? Testosterone, mm -hmm. which is why athletes take, you know, who want more muscle mass take steroids. And, um, and you know, there's variation between individuals, um, and um, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, but that's why we ban steroids. Now, the, what's controversial about, about like, for example, Castor Semenya and others is that there, there are individuals who, who don't fall into neat binary categories of male versus female who, have, who, uh, who, 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 have, who vary in, 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 in testosterone levels. And, and it's really kind of a complex moral ethical question as to what to do about them. And I don't know the answer to that. Again, I'm not an ethicist or a, or a philosopher. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm open-minded to different opinions. Um, um, you know, we, 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 you know, it's a, it's a cultural problem. It's, it's the interaction between a cultural problem, a very special one that affects a very tiny number of individuals. Right. Uh, I'm talking about elite athletes now, um, and 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 um, and biological problem and a bi biological issue, I should say. And uh, and you know, I don't, I'm sorry. As an evolution, there's no evolution doesn't give an answer to that question. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for that. And the book is called "The Story of the Human Body," and I'm going to put the link into into the show notes definitely an interesting book that everybody should read and i can't wait to see all of the research coming out of out of your research team so thanks, well, thanks. yeah well i should i should mention i'm just trying to finish up a, a book on the evolution of exercise so that will be of interest to you and your readers excellent we'll, <laughs> we'll look out for it <laughs> all right all right yeah. thanks a lot professor lieberman my pleasure okay take thanks. care happy running all right Thank you to Professor Daniel Lieberman of Harvard University to come on to the Endurance Experience. It was great to talk to him one-on-one -on -one after following his uh, work and his lectures for so many years. And you know, the fact that we can get nationally and internationally known people like Professor Lieberman is, is great. You know, he was on the... Stephen Colbert's Colbert Report twice. So think about that. And, and now he's here on the Endurance Experience. So that that's great. We thank him for his time. And so we've had uh, five podcasts now. Everyone that has been on the podcast has been a PhD. And uh, so we've gotten some great information, world-renowned people on on some of these topics of the science of self-propelled motion. The next guest on the Endurance Experience podcast is not a PhD for the first time. At least I don't think she is. Uh, my next guest on the podcast is none other than the marathon woman herself, Catherine Switzer, the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon who was nearly pulled off of the course, yet finished the race and set off a spark that would ignite women's events, women's running, women's sport. And it was amazing that I got a chance to speak with her. It was really an honor. So you don't want to miss that episode, which is surely going to be the most listened to episode of all of the endurance experience podcast probably thanks again for listening to the endurance experience follow event horizon endurance sport on facebook instagram and twitter for training programs and services to become a member of our endurance institute or for a complete archive of podcasts log on to our website eventhorizon.tv